Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of art, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Novo Day, and today we're going to be talking about art in film, focusing on Alejandro Inarritu's Birdman, or its other title, the unexpected virtue of ignorance. To hash it out, I am joined by my favorite bird man, Mr. Philip Church of philipchurch.tech. Welcome back. Um, it's avian guy. <laughs> I saw that I saw that uh I saw your title when you logged in. I've got a gritty voice too. I can do it. Are you, is that the birdman voice? I mean, that's all they do, right? I mean, that's I feel like they just kind of rode the like Christian Bale Dark Knight thing cuz it's not like um Keaton did it for his voice when back when he was Batman. So I just thought that was an interesting like so, of, of all the of all the meta stuff, right? Yeah. Film, oh God, there's um, so much. I, I thought it was interesting that they kind of like had him gr- like grit it up and go that like oh, I'm the Birdman voice. Oh, before we get there, put a pin in that. Uh, the the entire movie and afterwards is so is so meta because he eventually became. A Birdman as the Vulture, but before we get there, we need to tell the good people and why. Batman again, and he's Batman again. <laughs> All right? Why are we talking about Birdman today? So, uh, Birdman is because uh, it's a good fucking movie. It's a good, it's a it's great, an excellent. Movie. It's an excellent movie, actually. Obviously. But why is it so great? Well, let's do a T book tangent corner. I I forgot how great it was when I rewatched it for this show. I was like. Oh my god, this is so fucking good. Yeah, likewise, I, 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 there was like just entire like scenes and material that just completely escaped my memory. Apparently, I was just like, "What the?" There were parts where I was like, "What the fuck?" I've seen this movie multiple times, and I right. still was like, "What the fuck?" Exactly. I think that's why I wanted to talk about it today uh, and bring Dance. back into the stratosphere because it was groundbreaking people forget this this was it was a first of its kind in terms of cinematography because of the long shots and cut to look as if it's one continuous shot right we've never seen that before i mean it's been done a little bit since then with other media mediums such as television shows and And interestingly to throw it back to another episode um there's probably a bit of children of men to thank for just the long take aspect but the the movie wasn't nothing but long takes much less obviously children of men took place over a period of time whereas this really does feel like obviously it's it's condensed but it has that aspect of like seamless transitions and things do just flow Mm -hmm. so of course it's not like you go through actual few days in a few hours but it feels like you do. It feels like you're just along, like right for because you know people sleep, people poop, stuff happens. So you don't you don't need all that. This is the this is the cliff notes. I was telling, <laughs> I was telling my wife TV Del Rio while we were doing this show, and uh, she had never seen the movie. And I pitched her like, or I didn't. I just kind of told her the synopsis and kind of the artistic uh, integrity with the cinematography and the long shots and it being cut as one continuous shot. And she was, she was just like, how I remember she just kind of stopped. She's like, but, but like how you have to cut, you have to, there has to be scenes. And I, it, it had been so long since I've seen it that I was like, wait, that she actually raises a good point. How I, I completely forgot how they did this and they pulled it off so nicely. There is some, there is some editing. There is some, there are some tricks in there, and we'll talk about that a little later. But I wanted to give the good people the reasoning, the why of it all, because yes, like a lot of our other shows, this was the first of its kind in a lot of respects. And in regards to the score, because people forget that this was almost an entirely single musician score and single instrument in terms of drums. And um, I want to put a pin in that as well, because the music is very important. It's important. People forget how important music and scoring is to any film. And this one mirrored it perfectly with the rhythm, the structure, and of course, how we got it in forms of the narrative. Now, before we can discuss, of course, we all need a little background. So Birdman was released in a limited capacity on October 17th. 2014, where it eventually got a wide release in November 14th, 2014. It was written by Nicholas Giacobone, Alexander Denaleris, Armando Bo, and of course, the director. 
Alejandro and Yerito. The film stars Michael Keaton, Zach Galifianakis, Edward Norton, Andrea Riseborough, Amy Ryan, Emma Stone, and Naomi Watts. It was nominated for nine Academy Awards. It won four, including Best Picture that year, as well as two Golden Globes, a BAFTA Award, and a SAC. Now, let's hash it out, Mr. Church. Of course, in a, in a film like this, we got to start with uh, the plot characters and narrative. It's a play within a play motif, and it centers on the adaptation of Raymond Carver's What We Talk About When We Talk About Love, a short Which story. Which is real. It's a real short. It's actually a short story and a collection of it's a collection of short stories that is named this. So it's 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 uh, it's a dual use. So the whole so the whole collection is called this, but it happens to be also an individual tale within said collection. Correct. Okay. That is correct. I actually thought I remember the first time I saw this film and I thought it was uh, like a made up. Yeah, I, I did not really know that until. I basically started looking into like researching for the point of the show because yeah, I mean, more often than not, especially with, you know, rights and just the things that are intended with like even beyond rights, but what's the intended use of the movie? You know, sometimes people don't want their song or their movie or their brand, you know, associated exactly. with anything in the entirety of a movie, right? It's not just the scene it's in like, oh, if there's a scene in which like this vulgar thing happens and like, we don't want Doritos around vulgarity. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, we don't want cheese. It's in right? this sophomoric. Jesus, don't swear. <laughs> um, so it makes sense that like, I, I'm, I'm used to things being fictionalized of it just being like, oh, that's obviously a satire, but how satirical and meta the rest of this whole experience is, it's all the more interesting that the sort of central point of our main character's thing is him actually working with a real historical American play that, again, it's this so meta that it really just feels like the only thing that's different is that just swap Michael Keaton's name for Riggin Thompson and Birdman for Batman. <laughs> that is an excellent point. Before we get there, and we will get there, I do want to talk We're about the, the layers map. of <laughs> the plot. So, yes, it, it starts with, obviously, the main character, played by Michael Keaton, as already joked about. Riggin. He is Riggin Thompson. And name. the super... Oh, I'll, I'll, I want to say that there is three intertwined plots going on with the long take narrative that we see played before us. The first one is he is a struggling actor trying to make it big again. That's where that's the first metaphysical, you know, level too, because this really was Michael Keaton's opportunity to get back in the limelight. This was and it was in a fucking film about a character trying to claw his way back into the limelight now that's the first level the second level is the drama that ensues between his actors because he's a very ambitious producer he produced directs and adapts the short story for the uh, theatrical yes not actual michael keaton no right that would be ambitious though man right? i would be very I'd impressed be, well again then we're getting like this is like i feel like even charlie kaufman somewhere gave a little golf clap when this movie give a little out. give a little wink to us wink. yeah he was like oh. <laughs> so we see yes his character play out the drama that is trying to put this play yeah, adapts, on directs and stars in this yes. wild little play what we talk about in new york about like lots. on yes. like big time like fucking broadway yeah and and then and then deeper to that is of course a familial drama. He has he we see him struggle with his daughter played by Emma Stone. We see his ex-wife, we see his lover who's one to, who is one of in his the play. Yeah, his one of his co-stars in the play, Andrew Riseborough. And it all uh, seamlessly works together. Now, I, the, the writing, we have to talk about that. I know this, again, it's all over the map. It's so hard to discuss all the things about this in any kind of dense or that linear of a way, in my opinion. It's such a well, no, complex, think, layered film. I think, I think we will do it the best way we know how, and that's why I like to start with plot characters and narrative but the, you know we we can't talk about those things without the writing and i will say that's probably when i so this is all what's crazy is this is almost 10 years old and i feel like it could have been released yesterday and still be very relevant yeah honestly that was one of the other things that really struck me like the many times that i've watched it it it's 
something about like this analytical view of it and realizing like holy shit it's because they talk about real years. life stuff you know the marvel yeah. movies and all that stuff yeah so again it's yeah it's like um this is very much just a, an interesting almost like wake up call like slap in the face of like it's been nine years since this came out it feels so relevant and like it was just yesterday and what's yeah and what's crazy is i wanted to talk about the writing uh, specifically because this was written by four men and in hindsight re-watching it for this show it's very clear like there's dick jokes there's testy jokes and of course there's two chicks making out so that there was a, a bit of a glaring you know and most people aren't going to notice that but i think someone that maybe enjoys listening to the show will probably see the dichotomy of watching it now versus how it was in you know 2014 and but it's not distra not distracting but it's clearly written by four dudes. And uh, but I think it is done so well that when I was researching this, it was clear to me that they kind of didn't know what, what they were doing either. They were kind of learning as they went. Uh, I like my favorite metaphor is building the plane as we're flying it. They no. definitely try to create the piece, <laughs> create the piece, you know, um, from the seat of their pants, right? They're flying from the seat of their pants. And that's where we see it with the, the, the narrative structure and, of course, the, the mirrored score. Now, this is where this brings us to the metaphysics. So Michael Keaton was fucking Batman, as already joked about, and they make allusions to this. I actually I'm not sure if you actually read this in your research. He said this to the uh, writer director and Yorito like did is this is this literally written for me yeah well f yeah funny enough that um the the director did not write this with him in mind but you would absolutely but it was perfect yeah everybody else in the world including Michael Keaton would literally be like you're kidding right like how wasn't I your first choice because um, yes, he was, he was, I wouldn't say he was struggling. He just was out of the limelight for a long time. Well, yeah, I mean, he crushed it for a while because even outside of Batman, I mean, you know, there's, there was like multiplicity Beetlejuice. And like, yeah, like Beetlejuice, Mr. Mom, like there's all, he I mean, was he actually, was the guy in the 80s, early 90s. Yeah. yeah. Like, and you know, sometimes it's totally okay to like have a, a big run and then bow out. Like that actually used to be a lot more normal and respectable. People just expect you to turn out the hits, but like, you know, the man probably has a family and stuff. And like, when you do have all that success, step back so yeah it's like <laughs> that's one thing i definitely want to make also clear too is that like I, I i don't want people to think that we are over here being like michael keaton was a joke or blah 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 it's like no oh, he's, not at all like no. he's crushed he's it. kind he, of a legend at yeah this point. i mean exactly yeah. people still actually love and respect him and honestly god like one of my favorite things too when he like popped up out of nowhere was when he did um it, when he was the fucking like the uh, bed bath and beyond chief. guy yes oh. oh my god and the <laughs> other guys that was so funny <laughs> And uh, yes, I so I think it's it's so fitting that we got an actor that was kind of mirroring the actual character in the story and that they were doing obviously a spoof and co social commentary on the filmmaking and theatrical cultural landscape at the time. And then to make matters more fascinating and more meta is he went on to become a Marvel villain as Vulture, who was a bird man. I mean, you can't you can't write this shit you and can't make this shit up. The thing that it's practically based off of that, again, we're like, oh, is this based off of like his real life? He's even already returning to his legitimate like s s continuation of the Bruce. Uh, uh, sorry, Tim Burton, um, Batman universe, Batman in the upcoming Flash movie. It has literally gone full meta in real life in simulation style. It's all bad. Like it was the perfect time to do this. I have read a lot about this. And so I, you know, here's the thing about. Uh, you know, reading variety or whatever is like, there's such a rumor mill. So it is, is it officially stated? Can we tell our audience that Michael Keaton is Batman again, officially? Oh yeah. It's there's, there's been trailers. So out I thought there it was, internet. I it's, thought it was Ben. I thought it was Mr. Affleck. They're both in it. Okay. It's like a multi-universal, like Jesus they're, Christ. They're using it to help mind. reshape. Yeah. They're shitty, uh, anim uh, not animated. Um, so they're kind of doing what they did with Spider-Man where they had, uh, some of the other mm -hmm. characters come in to do the exact same multiversal, thing. Okay. same fucking thing. Okay. Well, Doctor I say I'm not a huge, I don't follow a lot of the, except for Batman. I don't really follow a lot of the DC stuff. I, I will, happily i don't admit, like it but i follow it because i i miss it i've actually never seen i've never seen any of the 
um what is it justice league films like any of the solo stuff i think i've seen one wonder woman and that was it (laughs) the first wonder woman was okay um moving on that was it yeah (laughs) That was it. That was it. Moving on. Okay, so uh, we can't. um, I'm going to, you know, I put in my outlines to talk about the ending. Let's actually hold the ending for the end. For the conclusion. Yeah, hold off on that because there's still so much else to like to bring up and discuss. I want to I'd actually love to take a moment to highlight some of the things about the writing that I that I felt was brilliant in that knowing that it's all going to be one shot. Time is of the essence, like every second matters. So pack it in is the way that they do referential relationships, you know, and that like things come back up. So for instance, like when you first meet Edward Norton's character, you wouldn't know that he's apparently dating Naomi Watts character, but it Mm. comes out just in the ways that first and they interact with each other. You're like, okay, they at least know each other. And then later it literally comes out fully that she says like they have a fight and she's like, pack your shit. It's like, okay, they live together. So like there's things like that and how, for instance, like Emma Stone's character has like a history with drugs. Uh, there's all these things that, you know, they don't have time. There aren't flashbacks, right? Like people don't sit down and discuss, you know, like in a weird, uh, typical, you know, Hollywood film way of just like the monologue, you know, like they don't really sit down and go, I'll never forget when I went to rehab, you know, it was an awful time and I'll never forgive my dad. Like, no, that's not what they do. That, there's I feel there's like- shit where like one character, you know, was like Naomi Watts says like, oh, her drug addled brain or something, blah, blah, blah. You when know, you were doing it, that, it sounded like Team America World Police. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's, what, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> that's basically what I was doing because I love how that's what South Park does is highlight just how cheesy and stereotypical so much of Hollywood shit fast. is and has been for so long. Yeah, very but, true. Um, but yeah, so that that like um, – Because it was a biting critique of the film industry. Yeah, again, the it's incredibly – At yeah. the same time, but also trying to revive it was, this you know, art was, house piece. Yeah, it's people being like, oh, you know, he's just some like superhero movie hack. You know, people being like, you don't, you don't have what it takes to do this. You know, so like they're commenting on how Hollywood even currently – and again, this was nine years ago. There was still Marvel and DC stuff, but we still have so much more now. So it's almost more fitting where people are like, oh, they don't respect it. You know, a lot of people are being like it's not real or it's not good shit, like blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, there's again, there's just all, all the different layers. Like the, the writing is so – it exists so much in like tangent to this or like reference to that. So it, it's very much a like – it it makes it worth a rewatch because it's a quick person's movie. It's a quick witted person's movie in that it's go, 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 go the whole time. So there's a lot to remember. There's a lot that you could easily forget. There's a lot to pick up. Um, and again, I'm not saying that like you have to be quick witted to like it. I'm not trying to sound douchey or arrogant. It's just that it's going to be worth a rewatch because it's so hard to pick everything up because there's a lot to pick up. Oh, I would build this film as an action film. You know, there's not set pieces like John Wick. Sure, it's not action like that, but this is an action film because of the movement, because of the cinema. So I'm glad you highlighted the writing because I feel like that actually tees us up to go into the next section of the discussion because the writing was the blueprint. They, They couldn't have made this film without that writing and uh, stage direction and things like that. And that helped the cinematographer and the rehearsals and the scene blocking because I read that the rehearsals were staggering. Like every actor who was, and this was an amazing cast for the record. Oh, hell yeah. But every, every actor that talked about it said, I I had to bring my A game because if I messed up one, like if I walked into a door too soon or too late, that would mess up all of the blocking and all of the rhythm for the rest of the scene. We'd have to start over for a 10 minute, you know, 15 minute, however long it was mm-hmm. set blocked scene. So it's. It's so important. Like, it's so intertwined. It's so interlocked with each other. Yeah. I mean, it feels frantic to watch, but imagine what it must have been like coordinating all that stuff behind the scenes, just knowing how many people are actually on that. Because while it also does appear to be in either like a very good set of a, of a theater or maybe even in an actual theater, that part I didn't really look it up. It was both. It I was, think. I was going to say, yeah, it was like a stage. It was clearly yeah, like the hospital scenes at the end. The rooftop was a scene. stage. Yeah. The yeah, rooftop scenes. That was scenes. a stage. Yeah. 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 But some of it felt pretty legit. But anyways, yeah, like even that stuff, too, of just how it felt the whole time. So, I mean, yeah, again, it's it's it was all over the place. It's frantic. It's lasting. Uh, and they even 
conceptually, like from the literal get go, it was that, oh, let's what if we did something that is literally one long take. So while there there ended up being time jumps, like they did a lot of editing and changes on the fly. Like, for instance, supposedly the final ending of the movie that they ran with didn't even get written until they were mid production. Right. So There's multiple things endings, happen, yeah. right. They're yeah. open to it. They're adaptive because I do feel like it is such a high concept and there's nothing wrong with they went for it. You know what I mean? Like that's the thing oh that my it's God, just, yes. they ran for it as hard as they fucking could. They adapted where they needed to, and they got such a fantastic result. So, I mean, yeah, everybody, the actors, the writers, I mean, everything about this was just see to your pants. I can't imagine exactly. how stressful this must have been where, uh, yeah, it's like, I don't know again. And, and yeah, like you said, any one thing could undo the last 10 minutes of perfection. Oh yeah. It was, it was a lightning, lightning in a bottle kind of, I think project, because I think not only the actors knew that again, just, I mean, we didn't, we didn't spend a ton of time on the other characters, but yeah, Emma Stone as the, uh, you know, drug recovering drug addict daughter, I, I really feel like, uh, and this is no surprise probably to a lot of people, um, Edward Norton would steal a lot of the show. He would steal a lot of the scenes with his, because, you know, because sometimes I feel like he plays those characters so well. That's that kind of sometimes, who he is. Yeah, sometimes you think he that's actually who is he a is bit, in real life. He, he's a bit of a diva. He is a bit like high maintenance and whatnot. Well, I have and, read and that he's the seriously. opposite. You know, I've read that maybe for characters, he can turn into that a little bit like method, but not as bad as like fucking Jared Leto or something. No, 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 no. Again, yeah, I'm not I am in no way saying he is that level. I just I just have heard that he he kind of can like take it just slightly too far, but is aware of it and is still obviously again, he gets hired. Right. He's right. Yeah. People don't think he's a mockery the way that people just rip Jared Leto to shreds. So (laughs) well, I actually I mean, that was that was the first, you know, example that popped in my head. I actually uh, uh, have a little bit of respect for a lot of Jared. No, the man Leto's. is dedicated to his crap. You no, know, like for Requiem for a Dream. He goes about know. some things in a silly way, and he's his real life is also hilarious as all. But um, <laughs> no, is I don't. I, I am in, in no way trying to disparage Edward Norton. And again, the man is so talented to where I kind of get it. And what's funny is that this is also kind of meta because he actually literally pitched himself to the director, saying that a very similar thing of how like Michael Keaton was like, wait, was this written for me? Well, Edward Norton was one of the people who had dabbled in in stage and film. So he actually approached the director because he liked the director, heard that there was like a new script going around or something, read the whole thing, apparently loved it and like tracked the director down and was like, dude, this role is like perfect. Like you would be doing it <laughs> like I, for, I forget exactly what I read that he said, but it was pretty interesting how he also was just like, I want to get in on this. You know, exactly. Like oh, yeah. what it could be. So yeah, I do like that he was cast for it because he played it amazingly. Uh, again, just a bit cocky and like almost too avant garde. You know, again, like practically condescending, but at the same time, like he would turn around and then just kind of be like, "Sweet shit, champ!" And then like, can't you know, blast a thumbs up and leave. So it was interesting. He was all over the map. What's What's brilliant though is they actually would write lines and li- lines and characters in. The, in the film and in the story to to emulate how silly that can be you know like when the uh I, I believe two characters and even like a stranger on the street like does a line and then turns around and was like was that too much did, did should i i just wanted to give you a yeah range. i just wanted to give you range and, you know and it's i i feel like that t- a tiny little moment really encapsulate the the metaphysical like the meta moments of how a lot of these really do play out in in real theatrical rehearsals and things like that and um it just made everything land a little more perfectly and uh but that that brings us back to the yeah the scene blocking and all this stuff i mean like reading about like how they had to work with just lighting you know real versus artificial and how they wanted things to look and how things were edited together. I think some of my favorite things were when we would see a set of characters and then the camera would just keep going and move. And we could see that there was a time jump because they're like one that stands out to me was Edward Norton's character and Emma Stone's are kind of fooling around on the top late, like level of the stage. And then the, the camera pans over 
and then now we see Edward. Yeah, you Norton think in that the they're rehearsing because it makes perfect sense that they w should be rehearsing. But then by the time the camera is down there, there's an actual audience, and then it's a real show. Yeah, hence Edward Norton is in it. Yeah, I mean that was brilliant. Yeah, the, and they would do stuff like that all the time. Like you would really, it's like uh, you know, where's Waldo? Like there was so many times when I was rewatching this that I was like, okay, where are the editing? You know, where is that moment where it was clearly like sometimes they would be like a character be walking down a hallway and the lighting would go completely pitch black. And, you know, you know, in our minds, I think to a lay person, they would never notice. But to like me and you, I probably our spidey sense went off like, OK, this is where it was cut. And then they, you know, they they film the next scene and then they and then the editing floor. Uh, they they spliced them together, so it seemed seamless. So I would I would look to little things like that. So anytime there was like a hallway or someone was entering or exiting a scene, that's usually when I would see the tiny little split second breaks of where the editing clearly changed. I mean, there was special effects, like there was a complete night into day kind of you know where like the camera is just held like oh, yeah. on a building or something, Whole, you know, and yeah, it goes night into the day or, or vice versa. <laughs> there's, there's special effects in this film. <laughs> right. And well, there is, I think some of the, the ones that I loved more were the practical, like him just like thinking he's moving shit, you know, with his I mind didn't, and yeah, nothing. I loved the practical stuff because it was like, so like just it was simple, sort of but muted. effective. Yeah. It was just there. Like it was never meant to take focus. him floating, you know, like this very like the, the random spinning opening. or moving of a thing. Yeah. Just that, that stuff was interesting too, because it, 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 it just goes back to the writing of them doing a pretty damn good job of making you question whether is he insane or is certain amounts of this real or both like what's actually happening. I think there, and there's enough, there's enough, uh, moments of clarity, you know, I think a good example of making making it clear to the audience that this is indeed in his head. I think there's some films and stories that we probably covered and we all know that make it intentionally ambiguous, that it doesn't matter if from the beginning, middle, end, you don't really know what's what. And it's up it's up to you, the audience, to determine what kind of what it was what kind of movie you you wanted to see in your mind where this one it was clearly going on in his mind like when he was flying and things like that and getting back to the to the theater and then the the taxi cab driver you know runs after him like you gotta pay yeah. me you gotta pay me and that was like those right. little moments are they're very subtle but they happen all the time throughout that's the what film. i'm saying like even that struck me again as like i don't remember that specific detail so that doesn't mean i maybe didn't notice it Mm. Um, like just in general or like on your, uh, you know, where, what you didn't remember on your rewatch. I mean, I guess just in general, um, like I said, there's, there's so much to the movie because it is, it's nonstop. Every second is very intentional and packed as full of stuff as possible. So is there a part of you that still thinks he, he has powers? No. Okay. <laughs> he definitely does not have powers. Spoiler alert. Sorry. If anybody that saw this one time in like 2014 was like, oh, no, wait, he, he is he is really Birdman, right? No, he's not Birdman for the record. No, it, they were uh, movies in this universe. Uh, it's in this universe, like that is I mean, he is he is definitely um, going, you know, you know, you know, Novo loves some descent into madness stories. He's clearly going mad with his anxiety and depression and everything he's going through the familial struggle, familial struggles. And him just realizing who he is because he I, I man, when like Emma Stone tells him off, you know, like you're nothing that oh, yeah. kind of that monologue, like when yeah. he's like the whole movie is him coming to terms with who he really is and how yeah. hard that is. He feels like he's in his final throw. I mean, again, he, he emphasizes it at certain times when he's just like, like, I have put everything into the you know like he's like he really is like he's he could sort of snap i mean this is his hail mary he feels like this is the end of his career or whatever possibly but he channels all of that into an amazing performance to the point where again spoiler alert spo spoiler alert he really tries to kill himself at the end of not the preview but the real showing the very first showing to uh, a normal audience and I felt like that was captivating, too. When I was I remember seeing that I actually saw this in the theater with a friend in 2014. And I remember th it coming to that moment. And I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, oh sh what, what is going to happen? And this is where this is where it's fun to talk about the ending, because in hindsight, after researching this, 
it was, to your point, interesting to learn that there was multiple endings. Because I think one of the endings was he really kills himself, and we kind of like see the aftermath of that. Yeah, I mean, just yeah, it, like it, it actually wasn't even uh, similar to what you would have thought was like a suicide in the movie. That he, I, I, the, what I read was that he uh, drowns himself or tries to drown himself somewhere or something. Like, yeah, it, it, well, it's, he it's, talks about that with his ex-wife, you know, and the jellyfishes were all over him, things like that. Because he was caught cheating and his ex-wife throws everyone out of a party and he tries to kill himself. And he says jellyfish surround him and he actually claws his way out of the ocean to live again. Yeah. And um, so that that makes sense that maybe he would try that again or something like that in an ending. I actually liked, I mean, for the record, I like what they chose. I feel like this was, it was still ambiguous. There wasn't, there wasn't a clear cut ending, but I really did like it. I'm totally okay with the open endedness of things like this sometimes. Absolutely. That, like, okay, so it's one thing if it's in his head, but that like the people around him are reacting to it, including yeah. his own daughter. Right. That's where, well, he would see th- this is where I still think is probably in his own mind because he would often see other people seeing his delusion. So I'm not even sure if if she was really in that in the room at the end of the movie when he jumped off or, or flew, we don't know exactly what happened. I mean, in my mind, there was maybe an empty room, put a pin in that. We'll come back to that because before I, before we, um, tie a bow on this B, I want to talk about the music. What did, what was your uh, first impression of the music? It was also chaotic in a way. Um, oh in, yeah. In the fitting Fucking ways. Jazz, jazz, jazz yeah. drums. Yeah. Literally the whole it was film. just pretty much percussion. Yeah. Um, For the record, we need to tell the good people that drummer's name is Antonio Sanchez. And I, 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 I waited to tell you this on air, so it'd be a little bit of a surprise. He's actually one of my favorite drummers of all time. I've oh. actually followed his career for a long time. So when I learned about that, so when I was watching the credits roll at the end of the movie, I was like, oh, fuck, Antonio Sanchez. I know, I know exactly who this is and why he was hired for this role um to do this did you know that he that they got robbed you know he was supposed to be did you read about this he was supposed to be nominated you know for uh you know an academy award or whatever you know he was they have to submit you know an application for you know film scoring you know hyphen antonio sanchez and they declined his his um application for a nomination because they didn't think it was only they they their excuse their problem with it was there was scenes that involved traditional scoring music so it wasn't just him but they used other mu- music it wasn't original scored music except for Antonio Sanchez's drums that's where they were like they felt snubbed so yeah so he got completely snubbed him and the director for um, their a, a nomination attempt for best score. They didn't even get to be in the running. They did not. They the the academy denied the application. So it was chaotic. It was. I don't know. I feel like it. I can't see the movie without it, though. Agreed. Yeah, it, it yeah. would be strange with 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 much else. Um, it, it it fit. It really was like spot on. Um, I and I loved that. There's the meta moment where he literally like the guys there. And the, is that's also just one of those. That's not him, part. you know, for the record. Yeah, right, that's, but, it's, but yeah, that, that was like an actor. And I kind of wonder if that's part of it, though, is just like, is this another thing where just like he sees himself flying? It's like, is this obviously like the drumming is like, so, OK, so does he have this jazz, jazz drum in his like head? In his is head? This, is this yeah. also part of his narrative? You've got the Birdman mm. voice. He's got the music like this is is all about him. It's his his story, essentially. Right. So if if he's you know seeing shit like oh he thinks he has powers he thinks birdman is talking to him blah 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 does he not think he has his own soundtrack and would he not see that drummer sometimes so that's kind of how i took that and i thought it was pretty another like just fun twist on the and like what's real oh my god yes i mean and like the they actually went really far with trying to create a language with the drums just for this film and Antonio Sanchez um I read that he originally wrote drumming themes just like you know like you know Hans Zimmer will write like melodic themes for certain scenes and certain characters 
And Antonio Sanchez did the exact same approach, but with the drums, which is fucking unheard of. Like this never happens in, in films of these caliber. And so I thought that's why it was another such a standout art house film piece for them to not only you know fly by the seat of their pants like we joked about earlier but also do it with so many different levels of the film including the music and yeah i can't see it in any other capacity um of course they didn't use the themes you know because we didn't we didn't hear repeated rhythmic phrasing or or drum theory in the rest of the film so it was pretty much improv i think you would probably watch the scene and then play over it kind of things like that that kind of music scoring and um improvisational approach to you know if there's something chaotic the drums were chaotic right if there was something simple the drums were you know four on the floor and um there was that that mirroring aspect that i just feel like really landed i i just i was i was so impressed and listening to it and really having my all my listening my skills you know on 11 for for um, my rewatching of this movie so let's bring it on home let's uh, tie a bow on this b and uh tell the good people why they should study birdman artistically um but before we get there i do want to hear your interpretation of the ending what did you think happened? I mean, I think it was just literally his, like, he kind of is figuring himself out. That's, he feels like he's, like, flying. Like, he's obviously just feels like he's hit something or found something. Um, so, obviously, just like he's not really Birdman and doesn't really have powers. Like, he ascended, like, you know, he, he got, he made it kind of a thing is what I'm hearing. You know, kind of like when Zach Galifianak- Galifianakis' character yeah, yeah, is like. Yeah, is this what you wanted? Yeah, you know, and he. That is what he wanted, right? He wanted to be a star again. Yeah, again, I mean, this literally has has him back on top. He's all of a sudden got a rave review, uh, or, or like you know, pretty much oh, a, that, seeming, seeming oh, that like critic, a rave review. That yeah. Bitch. <laughs> so uh, I feel like it, it just um, the ending is uh, as metaphorical as the rest of it. I didn't take it literally. Um, yeah, but I still like the idea of all the rest of it, and again, just how it's it's all like just his story. It, it it helps drive it all home, especially with the the just masterfully playful way, though, that they do weave that in and out of the mm-hmm. just what's real, what's not like what's going to happen next. Like it kind of helps keep you on your toes, but like just have that little bit of like never really knowing what's going to happen next in such a again, just fast paced, chaotic movie. So that was a really nice way for me to to put my perspective to just he's re blossoming I mean, he's he's got like a phoenix re- reborn yes perhaps so then tell the good people why should we study it as much as we've talked about how fast paced frantic chaotic and all these things that it is again it's dramatic it's intense obviously that takes a lot to coordinate like just seeing it will is one of the only ways to help understand how much time had to be spent just so slowly and meticulously in the years leading up to it. And then obviously production itself could have only ever been so little frantic because again, you're, you know, doing these long 10 minute scenes, you're blocking these things. Like it it just, the way that everything came together with such careful planning to make this beautiful whirlwind, like again, fast paced, like story. Uh, it, it's, it, it is masterfully done. It is, is such a perfect marriage of all of these different sort of random atypical things. Nothing about it is that standard. And so to get such a amazing finished product, uh, speaks to the talent Uh, I think, and just efforts, obviously, that went into making it. In other words, it's a masterclass in taking an artistic risk and using all of your talent and ambition and drive to making sure it lands, to making sure it comes together. And we it came out the other side in the best way possible. And I think it'll just it just it'll stand the the test of time it's one of those kind of films oh for sure again it, it hardly feels like it's been 10 years it already still just exactly like it's still incredibly relevant and and awesome and impactful absolutely yes i mean this I, the best art is the kind of art that feels timeless you can pick it up anytime and it still feels like it's relevant and it resonates and this is one of those films
So thank you guys for listening. That is Birdman from top to bottom. I want to thank you. I want to thank my guest, Mr. Philip Church. But before we go, you know we got a little extra for you, a little icing on that cake, a little cherry on top with what we call the gem of the week. If you're new to the show here and don't know what the gem of the week is, it's something we like to talk about here at the end, but doesn't always fit into the scheme of the episode because it may just be on our radar in the last day, last week, maybe last month. I don't know, but we want to give it to you guys so you guys can dig deeper. Now, before we get there, let's talk about their sponsor. Today's gems are brought to you by Zencaster. Zencaster is our go-to tool for remote podcast recordings. What's great is that you can record separate audio and video tracks, and it's all backed up on a secured cloud, so you never lose your hard work. Even better, it's easy to use, and there's nothing to download. So go to zen.ai, that's Z-E-N dot A-I slash Art of the Beholder, or just use promo code Art of the Beholder and get 30% off your first three months with the pro account. Now back to the gyms. Mine are, I got, it's like we're getting married, Philip. I got a, I got uh, something old and something new. Um, my old thing is um, me being such a big fan of Antonio Sanchez. I wanted, if you, <laughs> if you haven't heard anything else by him, except for the work he's done in this film, I want to direct your attention to what he does with, jazz guitarist one of my favorite guitarists of all time and we should eventually do a piece on him and that is pat metheny so in pat metheny um he often has you know um his his band is called the pat metheny group antonio sanchez is the drummer for that band and an album that i direct all of you guys to is the way up by Pat Metheny Group. It's an absolute spellbinder. The other one, uh, the other gem is, I'm a little late to the party, but I finally got around to seeing Spencer, the um, kind of avant-garde, strange tale of Princess Diana. And um, long story short, it's, ugh, it's everything I love in a film. It's another Descent into Madness kind of story, but with a real life historical figure. You know, uh, I'm a pretty much a big old nerd. And so I'm going to throw it to the uh, Dead Space video game remake. OK, uh, I'm glad you bring this up. I just I, I do love a good horror movie uh, and therefore did you play? Game, the? Like... Let, let's start here. Did you play the original? Yes, I played the original, too. And I think the reason and I loved it. Don't get me wrong. I think the, re the reason I am hesitating to buy it is I feel like. I've already played it in a way, you know, like I've already played this game. So convince me and maybe all, uh, the other people that are on on the fence. How is it different? Well, to be very fair, um, I actually just caved and got it like. Oh, wow. It's very fresh. Yeah. So I, I, what I've played so far, again, it looks awesome. It feels good. Um, it's creepy. It's mood. It's modal. The graphics are amazing. So, so far it seems pretty great and it's been so long since I had, I've played it that like, mm. yeah, I know that I've played it before, but at the same time, like there's other video games that I will also just replay like, again, speaking of watching movies over and over again, like, you know, I'm going to replay certain great games over and over again. Oh, I'm going to buy it eventually. Don't get me wrong. I want it to come down a little, a little bit, but I, I mean, it you know, we, we all know we got a graphical improvement. It looks beautiful. You know, I think a lot of big horror fans, especially in the gaming industry uh, and community, love Dead Space. I feel like it holds a special place in all of our hearts, and it does. And does Isaac, hearing him actually speak now in this remake, um, is it all landing? I mean, again, so far, yeah. Because, well, in the original, he was silent protagonist. He was Link. He, he doesn't, so far, he doesn't talk that much. Like I said, I, I'm i sure that as I go on and see more cutscenes, like I'm saying, I, I've, I don't know that I'm even finished with like just the introduction. And there are still other characters talking too. So it's like, mm, true. it does seem to be landing because it's blending in as just part of conversation. Um, so I mean, it can, I mean, yeah, I guess because like it's not standing out as I'm like, wow, this guy's great necessarily. So the guy's doing a great job as far as making it like natural and fit. Is that it? You got any other gems for us? Nah, it's been a pretty boring week. Uh, oh, I, well then I have a recommendation for you. Okay. Have you seen infinity pool yet? I have not. Okay. Go see infinity pool. And then that's Cronenberg, right? Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. Where son. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry. David. The, the, yeah. the young guy. Yeah. So go see that, and I know we'll have a discussion later, probably for a show. <laughs> well, all right. But before we do that, tell the good people how they can hold you. Oh, you know, just just hit me up. No, Call I'm <laughs> we, um, we gave we gave the digits on the last episode. I know, I know. Actually, I, I like Tom Waits one. I think uh, what was it? Yeah. 
I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for you guys. Um, <laughs> go to uh, philipchurch.tech. Uh, Philip is with one L in it. And that is where you will find the current stuff like demos and samples, as well as a contact form, uh, where I just kind of help post links to this show, of course, because it's important to me because I've always enjoyed working with Novo. Uh, and therefore, you'll be able to find... Uh, you know, links to all the rest of my various audiobooks and how you can work with me if you like what I do and you need my services. So, philipchurch.tech. Guys, check them out. philipchurch.tech. And you know what to do with us. If you want to check out some of our stuff, novadayproductions.com, at underscore novo underscore day, at Day Media. Like, subscribe, do all the things. If you want to be on the show, novadaymedia at gmail.com. And until next time, be good to each other. And as always, good luck and Godspeed. We'll see you in the next one. We love you. Art of the Beholder is brought to you by Novo Day Productions. Created and hosted by Novo Day and the Novo Day Collective. Facebook.com slash Novo Day Media. At Novo Day Media on Twitter and Instagram. Music by A Company. Facebook.com slash Aco Music 123. Aco on Spotify. Logo designed by Tom Justice, J-E-S-T-U-S, of thejusticecompany.com, and executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved. Jesus Christ, my mind.